maybe then we start with Emily, University of Oregon. And uh, I mean, our main, you might say, motivation to, to invite you was actually the, the Routledge, the Companion to Contemporary Art, Visual Culture and Climate Change, which seems for us to like hit things really on the, um, on the nail. But it's also that you um, that you in your work and your 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 you might say your attitude your position is also about the sharing responsibility and taking responsibility and actually looking at a sort of a more of a um, a moral responsibility and also that somehow this artist as an activist artist as somebody who can actually change situations rather than comment or um, look at it more abstractly or aesthetically. So those were our points of departure when we when we asked you. So um, maybe you could take it from there. Great, thank you so much. Can everyone hear me okay in the room and everyone else on Zoom? Is the volume a good level? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen then. And I think then you will be able to see my screen and I won't be able to see the rest of you very much, if at all. Um, so let me just bring up the title slide and you can give me a thumbs up. Hold on. Thumbs up once it looks like we're on full screen view. Does that look good? You see the title slide there, everyone? That looks great. Perfect. Okay, yep. good. Great. So um, good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, it's morning here. Greetings from Eugene, Oregon, on the west coast of the United States, the traditional homeland of the Kalapuya peoples. I want to thank uh, Trevor and the other organizers for this ambitious event. I'm really delighted to be included and invited to participate, although I'm Definitely regretful not to be there in person to participate um, in the fascinating workshops and other talks and panels that are taking place. Um, during these plenary talks, our windows of time to speak are quite brief, in fact, so it's leaving little to no time for discussion, but I hope that there will be other um, future opportunities to be in conversation with some of you down the line. And I'll do my best to stick within my time frame because I, I don't want to... Um, bleed over into other people's time. All right, so as Trevor mentioned, uh, he asked me to speak here specifically uh, to the Rutledge volume on art, visual culture and climate change that I recently co-edited, which I will get to shortly. But I wanted to first say a few things about landscape, a slippery and complicated term. I'm curious in your various work and during this convening, if it's been used to denote place, space, and or site, the built environment, human natural assemblages, or perhaps nature or the environment more generally. What do we mean in other words when we refer to landscape? In the volume, Critical Landscapes, Art Space Politics, which I co-edited in 2015 with Kirsten Sp Swenson, who will be speaking tomorrow, in fact, as another plenary speaker, we explore the surge of contemporary art that's engaged landscape, much of it approaching land largely in terms of its use value or material and socio-political dimensions as opposed to primarily its visual aspects. The book's epigraph written by the artists Alora and Calzadia in relation to their 2001 to 2002 interventionist project at the US Naval Bombing Range in Vieques, Puerto Rico, beautifully captures this emphasis on land shaping and land marking. Quote, we cut the word in half as if it was a sculpture, separated, divided it. The word mark now becomes a verb, something that marks the land. And in that marking, the term means how the land is used, how a land differentiates itself from another land by the way it is being and has been marked. Land marked by colonization, land marked by war, by millions of reasons. These marking processes are what constitutes and defines the changing status of land, unquote. In this book, we were especially interested in practices that took up what we termed critical landscapes or highly contested sites where ideological, geopolitical, economic, and other kinds of conflicts were boiling at the surface, playing out in space, and thereby coming into sharper view. In other of my work, I have further examined landscape as an indexical medium or material archive, one that bears traces and holds evidence. 
Indeed, my current book project focuses on art that tracks and thereby actively attempts to resist environmental violence as it's writ into land, air, and water. And I'm defining environmental violence here as forms of capitalist, colonial, and or racial violence enacted in and through environments, so instances in which environments themselves have been weaponized. And this could range from the impacts of extreme extraction on human and non-human communities to the engineering of climate as a means of dispossession to the uneven production, distribution, and effects of pollution. The Rutledge volume about which I was invited to comment is not about landscape per se, although we can certainly think about landscapes as indexing or expressing, maybe even performing climate change. For example, the now regularly burning forests in my own Pacific Northwest neck of the woods are a tangible and situated embodiment of a highly variable and dynamic global phenomenon. Our anthology, International in Scope, brings together some 40 leading and emerging voices working at the intersection of contemporary art, visual culture, activism, and climate change. And I just want to touch on a couple of the key ideas um, that animated our, our uh, work on this volume. Um, and I think of them in terms of a kind of double expansion, an expansion or troubling of both the categories of climate change and that of art. Um, we argue that climate change is not purely or even foremost a scientific or technological phenomenon or problem, but rather a cultural one, even if mainstream climate change and environmental discourse suggest otherwise. We write um, uh, in the introduction that we, quote, refuse to view climate change as merely a matter of carbon-driven Earth systems transformation, unquote. So many of the issues, and I'll just show a couple of um, screens, and I realize the text might be very small, so I'm not sure if you can very um, easily read it, um, but I, I, I put up um, a couple of slides with a table of contents, partly to um, show, and I can read the, the titles of these kinds of six sections that we developed. So the first being extractivism, the second being climate violence, the third being sensing climates, the fourth invisibilities, um, the fifth, um, which I can't see right here, I believe is multi-species justice was the title, and part six, ruptures, insurgencies, and worldings. Um, so many of the issues addressed by authors in the book from seed sovereignty to corporate agriculture to deforestation um, aren't things that seem at first glance always to be about climate change, um, at least as narrowly defined. Art is also treated uh, expansively to consider practices that sensitize us to the urgency and complexity of climate change and ones that model intricate, relational and oblique ways of seeing and knowing. The kinds of work uh, discussed in the volume um, tend to be not solutions oriented, at least in a kind of technological or technocratic sense or traditional sense, even if many of them um, seek to intervene in the climate crisis and the extractive view propelling it. Um, uh, and I'm using that term extractive view, I'm borrowing that from the decolonial scholar Macarena Gomez Barras, who's also one of the authors in the book. Um, and some of the ways that uh, the practices in the book do that is by visualizing or embodying other ways of being, whether those existing or that could be. In the last section in particular on ruptures, insurgencies, and worldings is um, really oriented towards these kinds of um, uh, new ways of, of imagining or being, or perhaps of um, amplifying existing ones that have been oppressed. Um, so equally, or perhaps most important to the book is that it foregrounds decolonial and climate justice-based perspectives. So I wanna spend um, the last little bit of time that I have sharing some examples of the kinds of projects that are discussed in the book, um, including the work of the Colombian Mestiza artist and activist, Carolina Caicedo, in her ongoing project, Be Damned, that she began in 2013. Um, I won't have time to really do any of these projects justice. They're all very complex pieces or, or efforts, but um, uh, just to say a few things. So um, 
Caicedo's work, uh, Be Damned, uh, takes up the subject of dams. Um, and so here you see on the left um, one example of many um, transnationally and corporately funded dams that are being built at unprecedented rates in Latin America and other parts of the global south, even while we do see um, increasing examples um, of the decommissioning of similar infrastructures in North America. Um, and she's commented in lectures before about her kind of worry that the global south will become energy slaves to the global north. I know energy is a big topic in Europe right now. <laughs> um, uh, so um, here we see uh, a little um, still from a video piece she did that is um, highlighting the um, sort of acts of resistance on the part of the peasant communities, the fisher and farming communities um, with whom she works very closely. Um, and so her work really highlights the way that these um, peasant communities, that their connections to place and ways of life um, here along the Yuma River we see are threatened by globalized capitalism and its relentless and ruthless march. Um, so one of the pieces of the project was a set of what she called geo choreographies, where she invited people down to the banks of the Yuma River, um, just downstream of a dam that was in the process of being constructed to kind of use their bodies to occupy the space and to spell out kind of messages of resistance. She identifies and calls for um, what she refers to as the collapse of a model. So she's used that term collapse of a model as a lecture for uh, title for lectures, as well as title for pieces of work within the project. And I'm gonna read a fairly long quote here um, from an interview with her in the New York Times tied to um, a feature article about her 2020 retrospective at the Inter uh, in Institute of Contemporary Art Boston, the ICA Boston. Caicedo says, quote, the dam is corporate made, impenetrable, unmovable. It cuts the body of the river in two. It cuts the flow of the ecosystem. On the other side, and this is an installation view from ICA Boston uh, of her show. On the other side, you have the fishing net, which is man-made, small scale, porous, flexible, malleable. It lets the water through, but catches the sustenance. We think of architectures as only constructing or imagining new possibilities. But I think it's important to also think about deconstructing things that are not working. Are we going to wait for these infrastructures to fall on top of us and kill hundreds of people? Can we think about dismantling dams and liberating rivers? Unquote. Another project that's profiled in the book, um, and actually the cover image on the book comes from this project, is a project by the collective, the Natural History Museum, and a project they did in collaboration with a Latinx environmental justice group in Houston, Texas in 2016. Um, so there is a contribution from the collective written by Jason Jones and Steve Lyons, who are part of that collective in the book. Um, this project is also discussed um, in a, another piece by the artist Amy Balkin in her chapter on visualizing atmospheric politics. So this project has a lot of aspects to it. I'm also writing about this project in um, my, my monograph that I'm working on. Um, but I just will mention here, um, one important piece of the project was a citizen-based air monitoring of East Houston, um, one of the most toxic petrochemical corridors in the world, and one that um, is a fence line community of almost entirely Latino um, residents. So um, the NHM, as I'll refer to them, Natural History Museum, teamed up with this existing and very active and important environmental justice group on the ground, they were already leading toxic tours, but the two groups kind of um, sort of joined forces and um, there were toxic tours sort of led in relationship to this exhibition that um, the NHM held in Houston. Um, they also helped to produce a map to kind of highlight the work that uh, Tejas, this uh, environmental justice group was already doing. And another um, important piece of the project on the part of the Natural History Museum was a simultaneous investigation of the corporate fossil fuel sponsorship of a local natural history museum in Houston, a kind of major institution. And in fact, the fossil fuel industry funds uh, most of the art world in Houston as well. It funds pretty much everything in Houston, according to um, the artists in the group. Um, so they, um, 
created a lot of uh, very kind of uh, striking graphics, or this group does. On the left was a billboard that was, uh, there were two billboards in Houston with this image on the left of a young Latino girl using the um, dinosaur. And I should have mentioned earlier, the kind of uh, dinosaur figure, this plastic figure is like a child's toy that they appropriate. Um, and there were air monitors attached to it. So these were spread around the neighborhood. I meant to say that earlier, sorry. So here she's sort of using that figure herself to kind of crush um, these um, diminutive um, chemical plants and these polluting um, industrial kind of um, sites. Um, on the right is from a kind of sim a project they had going on at the same time or slightly prior. Um, they led a campaign to oust David Koch uh, the very of the very well-known Koch brothers, a billionaire climate change denialist who was on the board of the American Museum of Natural History. Um, and they uh, led a campaign uh, to push him to step down, which he eventually did step down from his role as a board member at that museum. So they've been very involved in social movements, fossil fuel divestment movements, museum liber li liberation movement. Um, the political theorist Jody Dean, who's participated directly with the Natural History Museum, um, has written about their work in terms of how they make museums into, in her words, sites of counterpower. And she's also said that um, in their work, quote, the ostensibly neutral zone of the museum is turned into a base camp against the fossil fuel sector, unquote. So it's a very kind of insurgent um, activist uh, practice that they have. Last but not least, the Pacific Climate Warriors um, is a group that um, there's a chapter of the book devoted to. It's a chapter written by Carol Barbatko and Takai uh, Kitara. And um, so this group, Pacific Climate Warriors, is comprised of diverse indigenous peoples of the Pacific United in climate change activism. And in the words of Farbatko and Kitara, they are characterized by nonviolent direct actions, performance, um, arts, and prayer. Um, this is an image from um, uh, an action that they staged in October of 2014 when they, um, they donned traditional dress and they used traditional um, canoes in some cases. We don't actually, here we see the canoes better. Um, they're called vacas, um, very important to um, the um, kind of traditions there. Um, they use them to stage a blockade uh, at one of the busiest coal ports in the world. Um, and they actually successfully prevented for a period of time two coal ships from passing through the port. So their activism um, is linking decolonization with decarbonization. Um, and I'm going to just share um, another quote um, from the authors of this chapter, quote, the warriors manage a double maneuver through the performance-based visual nature of their activism. They're both fiercely protective of their ancestry, their culture, and their land, and yet they're also nonviolent, future-oriented, and politically astute global citizens. They are ready at the battlefront against sea level rise, but their battle is not waged only against the rising sea. It is against non-human fossil fuels and the depersonalized technologies and systems, such as coal ships, banks, and national economies that support their production, unquote. So um, the authors of this chapter about the Pacific Climate Warriors spend a lot of time talking about this performative element and the very strong kind of visual element um, um, and very kind of... Um, uh, strategic use um, of, of um, self-representation in their activism and the way that there's a very powerful kind of rejection of the figure of um, the Pacific Islander as a victim of climate change, and rather they present themselves and call themselves Pacific climate warriors. Um, I'm going to skip that slide and just conclude because maybe then that gives us a little bit of time for a question or two. All of these examples, like others presented and analyzed in the Rutledge uh, Companion, uh, reflect a strong eco-political orientation, and they do so in part by linking highly specific or situated contexts and much broader ones. So there's a multi-scalar and structural kind of approach that um, kind of coheres a lot of the types of practices um, in the book. And then the other uh, second thing I would just uh, close with is that in relation to this performing landscapes lab event, um, I think one other way that climate change as a subject might be relevant is in how it unsettles landscape. 
forcing us to consider new interrelations between the Earth's terrestrial surface and its subterranean geographies from which fossil fuels are extracted, then burned and released into the atmosphere, where their accumulation in the atmosphere in turn is inducing massive, accelerating, and highly inequitable transformation back on the ground. So that's all I have, and um, I will stop sharing my screen. And I'll leave it to uh, you, Trevor, if you'd prefer to sort of move directly to the next speaker or if there's time for any questions or discussion. No, I think definitely we ought to have just uh, one or two comments if we could or questions because it's, it's opened up an area which, which um, we touched on in the, in the open session. But this, as you said, far more explicit political um, um, model or the activistic model and actually going, going for it in a way which is not just on the side, not just in the context of, of a, an aesthetic which is, is produced for, it's, it's entirely, you might say, um, authentic and it reaches back at the same time it reaches forward. So this, this dualism of reaching back into something which we have, have, which we believe in, which is part of our identity, part of our DNA, and forward into another kind of communality, another kind of sharing, another kind of openness is actually really interesting because it actually um, goes against, you might say, the classical political models, and it goes against cl classical activism, which mostly remains against specific issues either specific issues or general general things. But the, the tying of the specific of the general, I think was all, also really interesting, but also the layered cultural approach. You might say there was, an, there was some avant-garde, uh, you might say conceptual things, there's some modernistic things. And there's also some, you might say, original, um, you might say from the, um, from, from the first peoples, you might say traditions. So I think also that kind of uh, mm, phasing was also really interesting. So it's a far more, complex model, I think, than we're used to in Europe. Um, mm. and, and I think it's quite, it's quite interesting to think how the Americas, not just America, but the Americas have, have developed that as a response. And it's so open, it's such just a scale, and it's so at the, at the same time celebratory. <clears throat> it is not, there's not doomsday in that. There is a, there's pride, there is belief. There, I mean, there's a sort of audaciousness, which is really uh, striking. Yeah, I mean, the examples that I selected, I could have, you know, selected other examples. And I think that in terms of kind of that tone of um, optimism versus pessimism, um, you know, there's a lot of variation, obviously, in the practices, too. It's difficult to sort of describe them as all being the same thing, because they're certainly not. But I do think that that kind of, um, to borrow the term from Donna Haraway, the kind of... Um, situated perspectives um, and this idea of kind of uh, actually the Macarena Gomez Farris also writes in her book on the extractive view about submerged perspectives. This is something that um, is not common with each and every kind of, uh, you know, artwork or practice examined in the book, um, but many of them. Um, uh, and then for me to you know, in the current book project monograph that I'm working on, I'm thinking a lot about ways that um, a you know, a project like the Natural History Museums project is linking particulars to uh, structures. So there is, again, this kind of structural approach, which also really aligns with, um, you know, work on um, how power itself works, you know, through structures. So a structural approach would be one that also is shared with in the environmental justice movement, which asks us to think not only in terms of isolated instances, but in terms of this, the, the structural relations, um, right? Or the, the conditions that um, bring about and sustain and perpetuate various forms of environmental racism, right? That there are kind of structural inequalities, structural forms of racism. So I'm thinking through that in relation to um, the book project where I'm kind of spending a lot more time specifically with the Natural History Museum project. One of the other projects that I um, am focusing on in my own book is forensic architecture and one project by forensic architecture. So that would be an example of a not exclusively European-based uh, project, Forensic Architecture, is comprised of 
um, a number of sort of practitioners from other parts, uh, from multiple parts of the world, but um, of course has been based out of the UK largely. And so, um, yeah, there are a couple of writers in our book who have affiliations with forensic architecture, um, but uh, that would be, to me, that's a really important uh, contemporary project, again, in terms of a project that's developing methodologies to do, you know, extremely kind of fine-grained forms of analysis and um, evidence building um, that then is intended in many cases, not only to kind of circulate within an art world or kind of a cultural sphere, but um, also within legal systems. Um, so very concrete uh, kind of um, type of practice. Again, very multi-scalar and very structural in, in a lot of ways too. Good, okay. Are you telling me to stop? Yeah, yeah yes, because yes, exactly. Um, time out, we have another question. Yeah. yeah, hey, thank you very much for your very, very interesting cases. I, two things that I, that occur to my um, attention is that in the 90s and the zeros, we saw a lot of artists engaging with um, the politics around gentrification. And yeah. it seems that uh, social inequality was addressed there by anyone who was in the art world because the art world was also driving gentrification. So there was mm -hmm. a guilt question. But what I was, I'm looking at here with, with an, a, a new, you are, for, you, are, you are leading my attention to the fact that when we talk about climate change and all the problems connected to that, it seems that people with a closer connection to their indigenous heritage find it more, find it easier to confront and, and work with the problem because they know their heritage. And it's for us, for the white, uh, majority in the Western uh, societies, it's very, very slowly occurring to us. We are, we are very slowly understanding that we too were colonized by, 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 by Christianity, for example, by, by uh, kings and, and royalties and everything else that has, has uh, colonized us ever since. But since we were so efficiently cut off from our pre-Christian heritage, we can't remember anything of that. And I, I find that these cases that you bring forward and other cases that I have been looking into over the last 10 years as a curator are so inspiring. And it, it helps me, for example, as a, as a, as a Caucasian woman in a, in a, in a Christian uh, so-called democratic society to so understand that also I was a colonized object, and also I have forgotten a lot of things that I really need to to get hold on to right now in this changing period of time. Yeah, I mean, there's so much to what you're saying. Thank you so much for that comment. And also, I I, I wish we had more time because I would love to have a, a longer exchange about this. Um, one thing I think of when you bring up this idea of kind of indigenous perspectives relative to climate change, an author that we really wanted in the book and um, had originally agreed but wasn't able to kind of um, to complete his piece um, in time for the book was um, the amazing Potawatomi scholar Kyle Powis White, who I think is doing some of the most exciting work on climate change. Um, and kind of decolonization or thinking about indigenous perspectives and climate change. He and many other indigenous scholars in the kind of Canadian, uh, the so-called Canadian and North, uh, US context, um, they have written about ways that um, while many kind of white, uh, white settlers or um, white environmentalists perceive climate change to be the first kind of apocalyptic or existential threat that in fact, um, for many indigenous people, the apocalypse has already come. It arrived with um, the colonists. And so um, he in various pieces of writing speaks about how climate change is not a new thing. We need to not think of it as a new phenomenon. He says it's part of an existing continuum that is a kind of um, 
a structural environmental violence um, imposed by um, settler colonialism onto indigenous peoples that kind of breaks relations between people and land and people and life ways, um, but also um, kind of situates climate change very differently relative to time, as opposed to how we often kind of read about it um, as being this kind of um, recent and uh, recent and new and impending kind of unfolding event. So he links it to a much broader kind of history of colonialism. Um, and then to your point about gentrification, I'm glad you brought up that topic. I think you're absolutely right. I think that um, issues around gentrification and also around privatization of space have been, they're, they're key issues of our time. Um, and uh, there's a lot of attention to those kinds of issues in the Critical Landscapes book. And um, I just yesterday, I'm one of the courses I'm teaching uh, at the University of Oregon this term because I'm core faculty in both contemporary or history of art and architecture, but also I'm core faculty in environmental studies. So I teach courses in both. So I'm teaching uh, an upper division environmental studies course this term called Unnatural Disasters. And um, I won't go into detail about it, except to say that our topic this week was climate gentrification, which is a very interesting topic, um, which is um, a, a term that's used to describe ways in which um, rapidly changing climates, particularly maybe in places we, our case study this week was Miami, Florida, where rising sea levels um, are, um, sort of directly intersecting with um, changing property and real estate values, that there are, um, we can look at examples of ways that, for instance, higher ground is becoming more valuable. So neighborhoods that previously were not on the waterfront that were considered less desirable are now the sites of intensive real estate speculation, very predatory forms of speculation. Um, and there are sort of, it's a new wave of displacement that's occurring in traditionally black and brown neighborhoods in Miami who are being priced out of places like Little Haiti and pushed to more um, environmentally vulnerable, lower elevation locations in the city. So that's a really, really interesting topic. And I think one we'll all be hearing a lot more about kind of in the coming years. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we're going to have to, to move on. So thank you very much, Emily, and uh, 